Well, thank you all again for coming out. It's, uh, it's such a joy to get together with other believers in the middle of the week to study scripture and to open the word together. So we're going to look uh, at the topic of humility tonight. So we're going to be opening our, Bible, opening our Bibles to quite a few openings. So I want to encourage you, if you didn't bring your Bible, use your phone or grab the one in the pew in front of you. And we'll be opening to several different openings throughout the night, just meditating and thinking about this uh, concept, this virtue, this fruit of the Spirit uh, that is humility. And it corresponds with chapter 3. So really we're unpacking not only scripture, but a lot of what uh, Jerry Bridges has said here in chapter 3, beginning on page 33. So we use that for our outline and uh, borrow tremendously from, from him. Uh, before we get started, uh, let's pray. Dusty, you have a microphone. Would you mind opening us up in prayer, brother? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow our heads, thanking you for this day. We thank you for this church. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Marshall as he leads us today, tonight on humility. Lord, just help our minds to be open hearts to be open, Lord, to be able to absorb in your word. Lord, uh, just be with us in all that we do. Forgive us for we fail in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I, this past week, planted, I guess you could say, some new grass seed in my front yard. And really I overseeded, I guess is what they call it. And I don't know what I'm doing at all. So I, I'm going to probably reveal how, how little I know about this in just a minute. But I bought a couple of bags from Lowe's. I bought the Turf Builder. You guys know this stuff, Scott's Turf Builder, and a couple of bags of, of Kentucky 31. And I went out, I followed the directions on the back of the bag. And so we're hoping and praying. Really, I'm asking you for, to, for agreement tonight. I want you to pray for my grass, my front lawn, if you think about it, because I'm really hopeful that some grass comes up. But it, it was interesting as I looked over the back and as I, I looked online and Googled it and YouTubed it, there, there's so much involved in the way grass grows. And you can get with these guys like at golf courses. And man, those guys and gals, they have this down not only to an art, but a science of how to produce plush, beautiful, green, this grass that you just want to take your shoes off and run through, right? And I'm hopeful and optimistic that that's going to be my front yard. Probably not, but I'm hopeful. But one of the things that I noticed on the back is there are steps and processes that they outline on the back of the, the grass bag. And they're emphatic that if you don't do these things, if you don't have these sorts of steps, nothing's going to come up. There's no guarantee. Grass is not going to grow. And one of the steps is you've got to water the thing. Uh, so one of the things that I've been doing as a part of my daily routine now is going out there and watering the whole front lawn to make sure that it's saturated and got enough water and hydration each day. And usually at nights when I do it, but it's an essential thing. The grass is not going to grow. It's not going to work if there's no water applied, if it's not hydrated. And what Jerry Bridges suggests to us in this chapter is that the fruit of the Spirit doesn't produce in our lives without the, the, the ingredient of humility. Humility is, is like water to new grass seed. With, without water, the grass seed won't grow. Without humility, we can't produce by the power of the Spirit these character traits, these virtues. So humility is, is one of those governing characteristics, that, uh, one of the, the works that the Spirit does in our lives that without which it will stunt and prevent and hinder other growth from happening. So I think he's right. So we'll unpack it from Scripture and see, and also from his line of thinking here from chapter 3, why is humility so important to the production of spiritual fruit in our lives? In the overview, and this is borrowing right from the chapter, the main idea is that without humility, we cannot hope to cultivate the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. So just a, a really brief summary, and, and we can interact here on this point. We've been two weeks, this is our third week, looking through Bridges' book, and he's really laid some groundwork. He's laid a foundation trying to help us understand how does sanctification work in a believer's life? How do we bear the fruit of the Spirit and put off the works of the flesh and put on what it looks like to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to be formed by the Spirit 
and produce these character traits that accord with the presence and the power of the Spirit in our lives. So we had two chapters. The first one uh, and the second one, really, it, it could be maybe boiled down to the, the way sanctification works is we become more like Jesus. Or the way Bridges says it, we take on God's character. And the other part of that is devotion to God. That's what we looked at last week. So the, the, the pillars or foundational parts of spiritual growth is it, it involves the taking on of God's character and it requires devotion to God. So anyone want to, uh, don't feel pressure, but anyone want to, in a couple sentences or so, what did Bridges mean by sanctification is taking on God's character? Why is that so important to understand before we look at these character traits, the, the nine fruit of the Spirit that Paul gives in Galatians 5? So why, why is it so important to think about this as taking on God's character? So remember the first week we, we thought about that these are our character traits, that, that they're, it's virtue formation. Maybe you ask it this way, is there a way that an unbeliever could approach this list? And why would it be different than the way a believer approaches this list? Why is character formation different than bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Is that, is that better? Why are those two different things? Yeah, so it's about growing closer to God. It's about a relationship with God. Sanctification is about Christian growth and growing in a relation, a relation and knowledge of God. So the, the point is, that's exactly right. So the point is that an unbeliever can grow in their character. They, they can have the formation of virtue without the work of the Spirit in their lives, without becoming more like Christ without sanctification occurring. Sanctification is a work of grace in the life of a believer that's empowered by the Holy Spirit that makes us more like Jesus. It's not just getting our acts together. It's not just, you know, I was a crummy old person and now I wanna be a little bit better of a person. Instead, sanctification is the progressive way that God is making us into the image of his son. In other words, we're taking on the character of God. So it's not merely moral reform. That, that's not sanctification. Instead, sanctification is heart-level transformation that's creating in us a way of being that accords with God's word and looks like Christ in the world. And so that's why, this, and this bleeds really over into the second part, where devotion to God is so important to this conversation. This is just all kind of catching us up to speed. Because Bridges says the only acceptable motivation for spiritual growth is devotion to God. And you remember last week, or if you read the chapter from chapter two, he gives a triangle, and at the base of the triangle is love for God and the fear of God. And we talked about these things last week, that the love of God and the fear of God produces desire for God, which is the way he would describe what it means to be devoted to God. Because sometimes we use these words and they're, they're really abstract, aren't they? They're really hard to, they're slippery. They're hard to get their ha your hands on. You know, what do you, what do you mean I need to love God? What do you mean I need to fear God? What do you mean I need to desire God? And, and, and devotion to God. That, those are all really religious. And, and so if you, guy on the street, break that down for me. What, what are you guys talking about? And, and what Bridges says is that devotion to God is the, the motivation for change. So if we're gonna be sanctified, if we're gonna be changed into the image of Christ in a way that glorifies the Lord, it's gonna take this sort of triad of God being what we are in all of. Remember, that's what we mean by fear of God, that we are in all of God. We, are, we, we don't have this diminished, low, pathetic view of God. Instead, 
we, we've, we've leaned into the scripture and we have this high, exalted, biblical view of God. We just can't make God too big, can we? We, we make him as big as we can get and then that's not big enough. We make him bigger. And that all, that reverence, that worship, that's, that's the fear of God. And then uh, the, the love of God and love for God is where we have our affection stirred, where it, we have a relationship with Christ. This isn't just, Christian growth isn't about packing our heads with a bunch of facts. That's great. You know, I, we want to pack our heads with facts. But the Christian life is about a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, where, where uh, we, we love him. We have affection for him. We, we have a, 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 a feeling, an emotion that is attached to our faith. And, and that's a, don't get nervous about that. You know, we're not running off the deep end of charismaticism or something, or Pentecostalism by saying that, I have affection for God. I love him. I, I, and then that is where we even go to, to the desire. That he becomes my, my delight. He becomes what my soul thirsts for. He becomes what I'm satisfied in. He becomes what I wake up in the morning more hungry for than breakfast. And that sounds really bizarre until you go read the Psalter, right? Where David talks about this sort of longing, this sort of thirst, this sort of desire for God that I, I want to know him and I want to know him again. I want to have him and I want to have more of him. And, and it's this continual pursuit of God. So the, what, is, what is devotion to God, Bridges, said, Bridges says? It is when we have the fear of God, love for God, and desire for God, and that becomes what drives us to change. In other words, any other motivation, I'm not trying to get favor with God, I have that in Christ. I'm not trying to get the affirmation of my peers what I really want is just the affirmation that I already have through my position in Christ. So my motivation then is purified. It's, 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 it's chiseled away. All the sinful ways that I could be motivated to change are chiseled away to where I want to grow, I want to change for the right reasons, for godly reasons. And what are those reasons? It's because I'm in all of God. I fear him. I love him. I want him. I thirst for him. I long for him. And I want everything he has for me. So whatever is mine in Christ that's what I want. And whatever that means, whatever, whatever worldly cost that is, I know it pales in comparison to what God has promised to be to me and for me in and through Jesus Christ. And so it's about shaping our loves. It's about reordering our affections where Jesus is not just something to be analyzed and examined. He's, something, he's someone to be adored and loved. The scriptures aren't just something to be dissected and learned. They're something to be savored and tasted as we commune with God and we fellowship with him. And in this love relationship, uh, not in a weird sort of way, but in, in, in a godly way, we, we love him, we desire him, we want him, we are in all of him. And that becomes the fuel that fills the tank that pushes us into the obedience of faith. And that's what, you know, the obedience of faith that, that Paul talks about in Romans 1. So, uh, that is all by way of summary. Sorry, that's a lot of summary. But it's important for us to realize it's taking on God's character and it is motivated by devotion to God. And so in this, in this week, what uh, Bridges says is that the fruit of the Spirit, we must understand, is fundamentally relational. Uh, that's the way he actually, in fact, starts out the chapter, the first sentence. And what he means by that is it starts vertically with our relationship with God. So we can't produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives if we aren't relating to God rightly, relating to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rightly and biblically. And, and so we talked about even, I, I think if, if I remember right in here, we talked about union with Christ, where it's our relationship, our objective and experienced relationship with Jesus and the Father through the Spirit that we grow in knowledge and love for God and the person and the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives and that is what is producing the fruit of the Spirit. That's why it's called the fruit of of the spirit. And that vertical relationship then begins to produce a different way of being horizontally. That, that's the idea in Galatians 5, which we're going to get to and work through all of these in the coming weeks. So it's not that I'm mustering up one of these character traits. Instead, it's that I'm, I'm having the vertical relationship with God rightly ordered and set and then it's transforming horizontally the way I relate to others. Because all of the fruit of the Spirit is fundamentally relational. I think Bridges is right. 
And what, what it will do for us is when we have the right relationship with God and the spirit is at work in our lives, we will have an increased capacity to relate to our brother and sister with the love of God, with the love of Christ. So, and that'll look like respect and love and deference and seeking the greatest good of those around us. And all of that, all of those things, especially when it comes to relating to other people, requires a tremendous amount of humility because people are really hard to deal with, aren't they? Uh, if, if you're married, you live with another person. If you're married, another person lives with you. <laughs> it lives with me, right? We, we know we're, we're flesh and blood, aren't we? Uh, we wake up with this mood, that mood, and another mood. And we, we have ups and downs and, and we work with people, our coworkers, and we relate to neighbors and we have folks that, that we brush shoulders with. And bearing the fruit of the Spirit is tremendously difficult if it's not produced by the power of the Spirit and it's not bathed in humility. Because humility will be the essential ingredient that lets the fruit grow in, in our relationships. Without it, we'll wonder, why is the fruit not coming up? Why is the grass not coming up in my front yard? Because without humility, we won't be able to relate to other people in a way that is self-sacrificial and Spirit-empowered. So, that means we also can identify some enemies. Uh, if, if humility is the, the essential ingredient, uh, drought would be one of the enemies. Not having any water that come out of my water hose would be an enemy of my lawn being quenched its thirst. In a, in a similar way, there are some enemies to humility. For example, uh, we, we can see how pride, maybe the polar opposite, right? Pride and self-reliance and self-centeredness and self-assertion these are enemies of bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our relationships. And, and here's the, uh, the beauty of the fruit of the Spirit is that it affects every relationship that we have. So I, I need to bear the fruit of the Spirit with the people that live in my home. I need to bear the fruit of the Spirit toward the people I work with on a daily basis. I need to bear the fruit of the Spirit toward the people I like. I gotta do it toward the people I dislike in my own disposition. It's not care for that person, don't want to be around. It doesn't, that doesn't absolve me of the responsibility. So the, the humility, the self-denial, and the crushing of pride is, is necessary for us to grow in this way. And it's a beautiful thing for God to bring this fruit in our lives because it glorifies him and it actually, it makes our relationships sweeter. Our enjoyment of relationships will be all the more increased if they're, if they're marked by especially if there's a reciprocity or an exchange where two people are bearing the fruit of the Spirit toward one another. Okay, so with all of that said, let's, let's look at a text where I, I want to show us the contrasts of pride and humility. So Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. Pat, would you read for the, that for us, brother? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple complex to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, turn your wrath from me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalt him, exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thanks, Pat. So we see the picture of Jesus telling, telling a parable and we see the picture of both pride and humility. And the parable is about some who trust in themselves. And the, the way Jesus is describing pride here is so soul searching. And it, it does us good to let the scriptures search our own souls because what Jesus is saying is that pride is fundamentally marked with a self uh, orientation, an inward orientation. And this self-bent is firstly, in verse 9, demonstrated in self-righteousness. They, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They had it all together. Their way was the right way. Their, their idea was the best idea. Their posture was the right posture. 
and see the, that, that just pride. Uh, pride that, that they were not teachable. They, they weren't open. They, they were uh, know-it-alls. They, they were religious uh, fanatics that had their own sense of self-righteousness apart from God, apart from Christ. They had it all together. They didn't need God. They didn't need anyone else. They, they had done what they needed to do. They were self-righteous. And notice the next thing in verse 9. They treated others with contempt. So pride not only turns us inward and makes it all about ourselves, all about what we want, our, our way's the best way, our thinking's the right thinking, you know, we need to get what we want, uh, then it makes us treat others with contempt. We, we relate to the other, especially if they're standing in the way of what we want. We certainly won't bear the fruit of the Spirit. And if they deny us what we want or what we think we deserve or what we think we ought to have, that's when we'll begin to bear the works of the flesh. We'll respond with anger, with bitterness, with wrath, with slander, with malice. Why? Because, well, I, this is what I wanted. It was the right thing. I deserved it. I have a right to that. And they got in my way. And, and this is the sort of posture of pride that is inherent to our indwelling sin. This is the natural disposition of our hearts, is to be oriented toward the self, self sufficient, self-reliant, self-righteous, and, con- and contentious in holding others in contempt. Now, the two of these guys, one, the Pharisee with the self-righteous one holding others in contempt, went up to the temple to pray. And Jesus goes on describing the Pharisee as one. Notice in verse 11, even in the prayer, there is a comparison to others to establish their own sense of superiority. What pride does in our hearts is instead of knowing ourselves to be a desperate sinner, undeserved of anything except for the grace of God, it makes us have rights that we demand. And, and, and I'm not talking about basic human rights. You understand what I'm saying here? Obviously, uh, there are certain basic human rights that uh, you don't want another person to deny you. Uh, but I'm talking about I wanted Hardee's and she wanted Wendy's. And well, naturally, my, my way's the right way. What are you, what is she thinking? And then when you cross, then I respond with anger and wrath and sulk and go off and, you know, it takes me a couple hours to come back around. And what, what happened? It was pride. So pride so often is the sin beneath the sin. So often what circumvents or derails our bearing of the fruit of the Spirit is that we can never get the plane off the ground because the, the, the pride is holding us down. It's holding us back. And so Jesus, he, he says, this guy prays, I'm not like those other guys. They're the problem. They're the extortioners, the unjust, the adulterers. They're the ones. I got it all together. My, my way is the right way. And then they're, they not only compare and contrast, but notice then they take every good thing they did and they distort into the good things they do to assert their own superiority over others in their own rights, ahead of the rights of others. Well, look, after all, you know, I, I give this, I do this, I've done that. I deserve this seat of privilege. They, they didn't do anything. They, I deserve. And, and this pride, this contempt festers. But contrastingly, in verse 13, the tax collector, which, uh, as you all know, would have just been so provocative to Jesus' original audiences, the fact that he chose the Pharisee as the prideful one and the tax collector as the humble one is just scandalous, right? But Jesus says it was the tax collector who didn't push his way to the front of the line. He stood far off. Let the other person go on. I don't deserve to go up there. And it wasn't false humility. It wasn't self-deprivation to manipulate to get my own way through the back door. We all know that. But there's a genuineness of heart to the tax collector. To the tax collector. He said, I, I can't even lift up my eyes to heaven. I can't even, I, I can't even lift my eyes there because God is, is so holy. He beat his breast in, in repentance and in contrition of heart. And what is his prayer? It's not uh, comparing himself to another to assert his own self-righteousness. Instead, it's saying, I rightly understand myself to be a sinner desperately in need of the mercy of God. God, would you have mercy upon me, a sinner? And then Jesus then he does the great reversal of 14. The reversal is, uh, you think that it's the Pharisee that's in the right and the tax collector in the wrong, original audience, but I tell you it's the humble. 
that will be exalted. And it's the prideful that will be debased. The one who's pushing to the front with sinful ambition, he will be debased. The one who is uh, defer, in deference and love and sacrifice to the other, preferring, he's the one that's got it right. It's a counterintuitive reversal where Jesus says it's the humble that will be exalted and the prideful that will be debased. So here we see this comparing, uh, comparing and contrasting. So with that in mind, I think that it's very helpful. It's, illustra- it's, it's an illustration of the pride and the humility that uh, we are tempted to the pride and the humility that we must cultivate by the power of the Spirit. So let's give some definitions here. Let's gather some things together. And uh, the, the one by Ferguson is fine. The definition by Sinclair Ferguson is fine. Um, I, I actually, I have one from Stuart Scott a definition of pride and a definition of humility that I want to offer. So listen carefully. (laughs) Excuse me. This is the definition of pride. It is the mindset of self. It's a master's mindset as opposed to a servant's mindset. It is a focus on self. It is the service of self. It is the pursuit of self-recognition and self-exaltation and a desire to control and use all things for self. Now that's ending the Scott quote. And and we can see here, even from the tax collector and the Pharisee, pride leads to selective obedience. And it's, it's using the obedience for our own ends, for our own justification. It manipulates even the good things in our life, pride does. And it's false worship. It's not genuine worship. The prayer is not received as genuine prayer. It's, it's pretentious. It's, it's false worship. Because it's marked by seeking to please self and it demands its own desires be met while judging, criticizing, manipulating, controlling, and using other people. And none of us want to be that sort of person in the world, right? Uh, but a part of what Christian growth is is looking ourselves in the mirror and me looking myself in the mirror and seeing where those remaining sins still lurk in my heart, where pride still remains, and knowing that there's more grace in the Savior than there is pride in me, that God, by the power of his Spirit and the resources of the Word, can progressively bring growth, never fully, will never overcome our temptation to be self-oriented in this way. We'll never overcome our temptation to judge others or criticize others or be manipulative or to sulk or to control the situation or to use people for our own ends. It'll always be lurking nearby. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can have progressive growth and victory. Never fully into our glorification. But we should strive for not moral reformation. Not, oh man, I just need to quit judging other people. No, no, that won't work. We need to, to strive for devotion to God. Remember, fear of God, love of God, desire of God. And taking on the character of God. Knowing that as we put that on, we will invariably put off pride and these other works of the flesh. That not only are, are toxic to our soul that are not glorifying to God, but they're actually, they're cancer to our relationships. And this is the work of the Spirit that God wants to do in our lives. So let me give you the definition of humility, and then I'll pause if you guys want to interact in just a moment. So definition of humility, this is from Stuart Scott, quote, it is the mindset of Christ. Notice that an unbeliever cannot bear biblical humility as a fruit. It's it's going back to the, the, the foundational elements. It's taking on the character of God. So it is the mindset of Christ. It is a servant's mindset, not a master's mindset. It is a focus on God, then others, a pursuit of the recognition and exaltation of God. It is a desire to glorify and please God in all things and by all things he has given. That's ending the quote from Stuart Scott. And again, we see it in the the parable Because humility leads to true obedience. It leads to a proper recognition of who we are in our fallen condition and in our remaining sin. And it leads to uh, us seeking, and it's so important, it goes back to our seeking for the right motive, for devotion. Humility seeks to be satisfied with all that God has promised to be to us in Jesus. And not seeking to be satisfied in the assertion of our preferences as we mow over other people around us. The reason we can live self-sacrificially toward another person, whether it's our spouse, a child, whomever it might be, the reason we can do that is because I'm not looking to that person for satisfaction 
joy or contentment. I'm finding in God soul satisfying joy that enables me then to look to the other and serve them and love them because I'm not trying to get something from them. That, that's why any relationship that you go into fundamentally trying to get from will never work out well. So if you have two people that are just trying to get something from one another, that'll never work out. And, and, and trying to figure out what the other person wants and giving it to them is also not figuring it out. And some people, you know, when you think about solutions to conflict management, well, just find out what that person most wants and give it to them. And if you find out what they want and give it to them, we can just make everybody happy and get along. Well, no, because what we're doing then is we're just sacrificing to each other's idols. It's not love. Love pursues one another's greatest good. So it's not until we're satisfied with all that God is for us in Jesus, love for God, then that we can turn and love neighbor rightly and not use them to try to get something from them inappropriately. Uh, so the, this love, this uh, humility that God is producing in our hearts progressively is marked by preferring others, loving others, serving others, honoring others. Uh, it is a posture of heart and a practice of life that seeks the good of others and the glory of God above self-interests. The good of others and the glory of God above self-interests. And the stakes are high. Dusty, what does Proverbs sixteen eighteen say? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So pride leads to destruction and it leads to a fall. And if you flip over, Dusty, just to Proverbs 22, 4. We'll see the opposite of that, in fact. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor. Yeah, so you see the contrast? 1618, the proverb says, it leads to the fall and destruction, pride does. But humility, Proverbs 22, 4, leads to exaltation in life. So the promise of God uh, toward the truly humble are almost breathtaking. And in, in self-denial toward sin and toward worldly things is actually um, not ultimate self denial. And the reason is this. When we deny ourselves temporal pleasure for the sake of God's glory, we're actually embracing ultimate joy. You see, see that? Self-denial in the present is actually embracing ultimate joy in eternity. So I'm saying no to the momentary fulfilling of my fleshly appetite and saying yes to a superior reward and a superior pleasure. And oftentimes we are trying to white knuckle change by saying no, 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 no to every desire that we have instead of redirecting our desires to find their fulfillment rightly in God and his design. Because the, the promise of God to us is exaltation in life. But what we do is we try to maneuver and say, no, I know best, I know how to get what I want. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go ahead and get it my way and you know, on my timeline. And when I assert myself like that, that leads to a fall and destruction. Instead of saying, Lord, I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna be patient, I'm gonna rest in you, I'm gonna take joy in you, even if I'm not getting exactly what I want out of this situation, and I'm gonna do what glorifies you and what is for the good of the other person involved. Now, that will, in and of itself, brush up against our pride because oftentimes, what is for God's glory and for the good of other people will, will be all over our fear of man. Because our fear of man, which is pride, will keep us from doing what we ought to do sometimes, many times. Because we fear losing the person's acceptance. We fear losing their approval. So it doesn't mean that we're a doormat, right? Our aim is to glorify God and to seek the ultimate good of the other person. And when we do that, it will crush our pride 15 different ways every time we do it. And it will cultivate within us a spirit-empowered humility in a dozen different ways at the same time. Because we're, we're leaning into the situation in a way that's not trying to get what I want out of it, not trying to just pacify what the other person wants, but I'm trying, what is, what is glorifying to God and what seeks the ultimate good of the person? And that's the, the motivation of humility. So what 
Bridges does, the way we'll uh, finish the rest of our time here, about 15, 20 minutes that we have, he gives five, I guess, shades of humility. And let's look at him in, in turn here. The first is humility that is in God. So if you think about a passage like Philippians chapter 2, uh, Philippians 2 gives us this, the incarnation, right? Uh, where Jesus takes on human flesh. Well, what Philippians 2 is telling us is that Christ exercised humility. Let's go ahead and turn over there real quick. So in Philippians chapter 2, you know the passage really well. In Philippians chapter 2, and Dusty, would you get Isaiah 57, 15? Isaiah 57, 15? And Pat, would you read Philippians 2? Let's read verses 5 to 10. Or 5 to 11, I'm sorry. 5 to 11. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and then he had come as a man in his external form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So the point of this passage is to show us something about Christ's humility as an example for the believer. That's what he's doing in this paragraph of 1 to 11. And here, here's the point that Bridges makes from it that's so important for us to see. Humility, you might think of humility, well, that, that's not an attribute of God. That's not a, a character trait of God. And, and that, it's, yeah, it's difficult to see. How can God exercise humility? Well, in Christ, we see clearly how he does. In Jesus Christ, in the incarnation, Humility doesn't just become God's command. It becomes his character to assume. Jesus Christ is the perfectly humble one. And in his perfect humility, he gives us the model of what it means to have self-sacrificial humility toward the other. And it's ultimate humility. It's ultimate condes condescension. It's ultimate preferring the other in a way that brings about ultimate spiritual good and the greatest display of God's glory. The humiliation of Christ above any other act of humility brings the glory of God and the spiritual good of others. And by it, he blazes for us the example to, to emulate by the power of the Spirit, to humble ourselves for the glory of God and for the good of others. So the point that Burgess is making in that, that first uh, hum humility is a Christ-like trait. So when we take on humility, we are taking on the character of God himself. Let's look at the second one. Humility before God. Thus do you have Isaiah 57, 15. What does that say? For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite, in lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Yeah, so what, what Isaiah is saying here is humility is not just in God. Humility starts in our hearts before God. The, the path to humility is knowing Almighty God for who he really is. And it is a high view of God and not just an intellectual ascent of a high view of God, but knowing God as he has revealed himself in scripture. It's when we have this view of God in his majesty and in his glory and in his transcendence and in his otherness, and it's, it really relates very much so to the fear of God. It's when we're in all of him, where, where we are all struck by the living God when that becomes the disposition of our hearts, humility is being produced. 
because it's impossible to have a high view of God and a high view of yourself. Isaiah 6 showed us that, didn't it? It's impossible to see the Lord sitting on his throne high and lifted up and not say, woe is me, the holy, holy, holy God of heaven, the high king of heaven. When my heart catches a glimpse of him, it produces humility in me. So oftentimes when pride is festering in my heart, it's because I've gazed very little at the God who is. I've gazed little at him in the word. I've gazed little at him in prayer. I haven't seen him and savored him for who he really is. And so I begin to be haughty because when I stop knowing and reminding and remembering myself for myself who God is, I get a disoriented view of who I am because the, the right orientation of my heart toward humility begins with the right orientation of my heart toward God as the high and lifted up one. So let's look at uh, another, uh, Dusty, can you flip over to Isaiah 66? You're just a few pages from there. And Pat, can you look up 1 Corinthians 15, 10? 1 Corinthians 15, 10. So we have firstly humility in God, secondly humility before God, and thirdly we have humility trembles at the word of God. Humility trembles at the word of God. Isaiah 66, 1 to 2, Dusty. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is, this, what is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So we have a lot of the same themes as we had in Isaiah 57. So God is creator. They're talking about the rebuilding of the temple. And, and, and what God is saying is that, that, that that's fine. Thank you for building the temple. But just remember, actually, I created everything that you're making the temple with. Um, so just, just remember, contextually remember here that the, the world is my temple. The universe is the display of my glory. I don't just demand worship in this little shack that you would build. The most beautiful of buildings would be a shack compared to the beauty and the infinity of God. But the whole world is a cosmic temple to display the glory of God. And then he says, I, I, I exist high and exalted, transcendent. I'm the creator God of all. And I exist with those who are contrite and humble. Again, the staggering promise of humility. God's presence goes with humility. So humility is a right view of God that was the second point, but now we see at the very end of Isaiah 66, one to two, it trembles at his word. And this is something we see, and we could point out there to those people, right? We can look at the people that uh, deny that God is the creator of all things, and they would assert some sort of evolution or whatever, and they would, make, they would scoff at God's word and make a mockery of God's word. And, and that, that's easy to say. They don't tremble at God's word. They don't fear him. But there remains in every heart remaining sin. And as believers, we too must continually confront in our own hearts our suspicion and resistance toward the word of God and our proclivity to exalt the wisdom of man and the ideas of man, even our own ideas, above the inerrant, authoritative, sufficient words of God. There is a, a humility that God produces in our hearts as we bow in submission to his self-revelation, to his word. He has revealed himself through speech acts, through his words and through his acts, he's revealed himself. He's given us his wisdom, his will. And as our hearts become attuned to that word, it is a posture of humility that the spirit is producing within us. Because every time our hearts rise up and say, no, I know better. Or I know that's what God's word said, but what I really need is this over here because that sure doesn't make more sense to me. Or I know that that's what God says is true, but I think this might be what's true. Every time our hearts do that, we have to see the pride humility spectrum that's happening. Our, our rejection, our scoffing at, our uh, inability to receive by faith God's word is a product, it is the fruit of pride in the heart. 
and our ability to bow in submission to God's word and joyfully and gladly receive it and walk in obedience to it and apply it to every aspect of our life is only produced by the spirit creating humility within us to respond to the word in that way. So we have humility in God. We look at Philippians. We have humility before God from Isaiah 57. We see humility trembles at the word of God, Isaiah 66. Uh, So Pat, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15.10. What does that say? But by God's grace, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not ineffective. However, I worked more than any any of them, yet not I, but God's grace that was with me. So the, the idea that Paul is expressing to us is he, he doesn't take credit and boast in things. He doesn't allow worldly, earthly realities to shape his uh, sense of uh, who he is or what he's worth or what his, his function is in the world. Instead, he looks to heavenly realities. He looks to, to God for those things. And oftentimes when pride is festering in our hearts, it's because we are looking to some external thing for fulfillment, for affirmation, for acceptance, and we are denying God the rightful right, the rightful place to be that to us. And that's why uh, the, the theme of knowing our position in Christ that is pervasive in Paul's letters has has nothing really do, to do with uh, packing our minds with all of these theological truths so that we can regurgitate them to other people and impress them. And it has everything to do with the fight for our very lives. The fight of faith is won or lost in our ability to gaze into and to believe as primary and to be fully satisfied with all that God has promised to be to us in Jesus Christ. And when we make anything else primary, it is pride that is swelling up to say, I know that God provided that, but what I really want is this. I know he said he would be that to me, but really I want this person to be that to me. I know he said that he would do that for me, but I really want that thing to do this for me. And it's exchanging the creator for the created in a way that is indicative of pride. So what humility does is it understands that I am who I am. I am what I am. I have what I have only by the grace of God, and I am satisfied not in what God has given me in earthly realities. I'm satisfied with all that God is to me in Jesus. So my contentment in the world is is governed by my contentment in Christ. And and my, my killing of pride toward material possessions or pursuit of worldly things, these ambitions of the world, the reason and the way I'm able to kill those is because I make it my ambition to know Christ and the surpassing wealth of, and, and, and glory of knowing God by faith in him. So I'm replacing these prideful patterns with humility. I'm putting off and putting on like Bridges talked about in the first chapter where I'm getting a rightly oriented view of my world and of my life that I am what I am by the grace of God. I am who I am by the grace of God. What God says about me is primary and that's humble. It's humble to to affirm what God says about you. It's prideful to ignore or deny it and to seek other things for uh, what only God can provide. Okay, there's so much more that can be said there, but we want to finish. So let's look at at one last one here. So we have, we're we're, uh, humility in God. We have humility before God. We have trembling at his word. We have here by the grace of God. And fifthly, we have the expressions of submission, service, and honor that Bridges brings up. So once we are pursuing the fruit of pride in our lives, or sorry, the fruit of humility in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will enable and produce within us a spirit of uh, graciousness, of teachability, of seeking one another's good, not being nitpicky or contentious or mean-spirited toward one another, not making unrealistic demands upon one another and then responding in sin when those demands aren't met. Instead, it it produces in us a submission, a service, and a honor. So let's look at a few passages here in 1 Peter 5.5. Pat, do you want to get that? And in Romans 12.10, Dusty. Okay, so what does 1 Peter 5.5 say?
the younger man, the younger men who be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility t toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we see, we see there almost a picture, Peter giving us a picture of exactly what we've been talking about tonight. First we have the command. The command is clothe yourself with humility. And this garment imagery, put off pride, put on humility. Put off the works of the flesh associated with pride that we talked about earlier and put on the, the fruits of the spirit associated with, the fruit of the spirit associated with humility. Clothe yourself in humility. And then what does he attach at the very end to the command in, in 1 Peter 5, 5? What will God do with the humble in 1 Peter 5, 5? He gives them grace. So attached to the, prom, attached to the command is a promise. So we, we pursue obedience to the command by placing our faith in the promise. So God, I, by the power of your spirit, I, I want to bear the fruit of spirit-empowered living, shaped by humility. And Lord, I believe and I trust that you'll give me every resource, every grace, every spiritual reality I need in order to do that. And I trust you today to help me to respond to my coworkers in ways that bear the fruit of the spirit and not the works of the flesh. Let me make you my treasure and not whatever else I'm wanting or desiring this day. Don't let me have any sort of demand that I raise to the level of if I don't get this demand met, that I'm willing to respond and sin toward you and toward this other person. But instead, give me the grace that's associated with humility and enable me by the power of your spirit to obey this command for your glory and for the good of those around me. And this begins to shape our language. It begins to shape our attitudes. It begins to shape our prayers. It begins to shape the way we approach scripture. We're looking for, God, how do you want me to exercise humility in these relationships today? And how are you going to meet me in grace in these relationships by the power of your spirit and through the promises of your word? So we see this need to be clothed with humility toward one another. And then let's get even down to a little bit more detailed commands in the next one, Dusty, Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing the honor. So, so here we have, list those off one more time. Sorry, Dusty. Yeah, so love one another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So think about that. So you're loving, you're, you're outdoing one another in preferential treatment to one another. You're honoring one another. What are, what are these? These are ways of relating to those around us that only the power of the Spirit can produce in us as we are being clothed in humility toward one another. So the way, uh, we won't go through all of this. I wish we could. Go back and read the chapter where Bridges talks about how this relates to submission, to service, and to honor in very specific ways. And, and what we must see here is that, uh, let, let's go all the way back around as we, as we wrap up here. What we're not saying is, you, you got to be perfect in all these areas, and you better clean your act up, man. You better sort yourself out this week and, and be a, a better person toward your coworkers and toward your spouses and no, what we're saying is, what Bridges is saying, and he's taking it straight from Scripture, is that God's will for us is to be conformed into the image of Christ and to take on his very character. Humility is a Christ-like trait. We want to take on the servanthood of Christ himself. And the way to do that is not, is not merely by moral effort. Instead, it's by devotion. Fear of God, love of God, desire of God, the devotion toward God. I want to know him. I want to, I want to treasure him. I want to, I want to have joy in him. And I want to glorify him. And I want to seek the good of those around me. And so then my prayer becomes, Lord, would you meet me in my moments, my daily moments, with the grace that I need to believe your promises and to obey your commands in such a way that shapes me into the image of your son and brings you ultimate glory. 
And the progressive nature of this is you don't get it right every time, but God gives more grace. We could go to James 4, couldn't we? Where he gives grace to the humble and he gives more grace. And so we're not saying perfectionism. Sanctification is not perfectionism. That's glorification. Sanctification is progressive growth in godliness. So what God will do by the power of his spirit is each day as we lean into the, to this process, he makes us a bit more, a bit more like his son. And this is how we grow day to day and week to week and month to month and, and year to year. And we, we increase in our capacity to have joy in all that God is to us and for us in Christ. And we, we become more able in our, in our lifestyle to put off the works of the flesh and put on the, the fruits of the, the fruit of the spirit by the power of the gospel, by the power of the spirit in very tangible, very concrete ways in our lives. So this is, this is sanctification. Uh, so this isn't go home and figure this out before we meet again next week. Uh, this is, I'll see you at the finish line and I'm, I'm running this race with you. And by God's grace and with his help, we can experience transformation. Our hearts can be transformed. Our lives can be transformed. Even those of us who have been believers for a really long time, God's not done growing us. God's not done doing a work in us. God's not done increasing our love for him, our fear of him, our desire of him, our devotion to him. He's not done making us into the image of his son. Uh, so before we go, any um, final comments, questions that you would want to raise before we conclude? All right. Yeah. Yeah, he did. tax collector he's the guy yeah so Jacob's saying Luke 19 read the story of Zacchaeus Zacchaeus was um, at least a model of that tax collector if not the tax collector from Luke 18 that when he met Jesus was humbled and experienced the grace of the Savior yeah well good Thank you again, guys. I'm so thankful that you come out and I appreciate your, your time tonight and I hope that the word is helpful to you and I'm praying for you this week. And let's pray right now and then we'll, we'll part ways. Father, thank you again for the, the privilege that we have as believers to come together midweek like this to open your word and to think about you and things that are true about you and to think in ways that are true about ourselves and about our situations. Lord, we, we praise you that you are not done with us. Uh, wherever we're at, that you, you meet us with your grace, you meet us by the power of your spirit, and you invite us to keep on growing into the image of your son. And we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in him. We thank you that we have every spiritual resource necessary to grow and to change and to continue to pursue holiness uh, as unto you, for your glory. So Father, we pray even this week that you would take the specific passages that we read that you would press them into our hearts, that, that we would meditate on these, that we would pray through them. Um, as we prepare to, to hear the word preached this Lord's Day, I pray that we would be eager to come together again to hear your word and to keep on glorifying you in all of life. So we, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray, amen.